Uh, thank you. The next item of business is a debate on motion 8062 in the name of Rosanna Cunningham on stage one of the Wild Animals and Travelling Circuses Scotland Bill. You can invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press their request to speak buttons now. I call on Rosanna Cunningham to speak to and move the motion. Cabinet Secretary, 10 minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Firstly, I think I should thank the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee for their consideration uh, of the Wild Animals in Travelling Circuses Scotland Bill. They've taken a great deal of evidence from a wide range of stakeholders and produced a very detailed stage one report, especially for such a short and concise bill. The Scottish Government has responded to their recommendations and I would now like to explain what the bill will and perhaps or equally of interest won't do uh, and indeed why I'm bringing this bill before Parliament. The bill will quite simply make it an offence for a circus operator to cause or permit a wild animal to be used in a travelling circus in Scotland. There has been growing concern about the use of wild animals in travelling circuses for many years. Although such circuses have not recently visited Scotland, they continue to perform in the rest of the UK and across much of Europe. The bill is a manifesto commitment of the SNP. Scottish Labour and the Green parties had similar commitments, as did the UK Conservative Party. It will address the widespread concerns that led to these commitments by preventing travelling circuses ever showing wild animals in Scotland in the future. It will also demonstrate to the wider world that Scotland is one of the growing number of countries that no longer condones the use of wild animals in this fashion. Previous concern about wild animals in travelling circuses focused on perceived animal welfare issues. In 2007, the Radford Report, the product of extensive evidence gathering by a committee appointed by the UK government, ruled out a ban on welfare grounds. By 2016, the academic Dorning and his colleagues considered that there was, nearly 10 years on, sufficient new welfare evidence to support a ban. However, the welfare evidence varies greatly with the type of circus animal, with much work focused on a few large, naturally wide-ranging animals, particularly tigers and elephants. However, when the Scottish Government began work on this issue, we recognised that there are much wider ethical concerns, and those ethical concerns apply to the use of all wild animals in travelling circuses. The Scottish Government consultation in 2014, therefore, asked specific questions around a potential ban based purely on ethical grounds. The response was overwhelmingly in favour of a ban. 98% of respondents supported a ban on performance and 96.4% supported a ban on exhibition with many responses from individuals and organisations giving detailed replies to the ethical questions posed. There are three main ethical concerns this bill seeks to address. First, the impact on respect for animals. Most people now consider it outdated and morally wrong to make wild animals perform tricks that they would not perform naturally or display them in an unnatural environment simply to entertain the viewing public. This is animals as entertainment commodity rather than as sentient beings. The results from the 2014 consultation showed that 89.5% of respondents considered that the performances required of wild animals, not simply their keeping, compromised respect for the animals concerned. In addition, over 94% of respondents considered that exposure to such acts has an adverse impact on the development of respectful and responsible attitudes towards animals, particularly uh, in children. So I'm grateful for the additional engagement with young people undertaken by the committee, its clerks and the Scottish Parliament Education Service. I welcome the results from their survey of young visitors to the Parliament. This showed that of the 1,045 children and young people asked the question, should it be an offence to use wild animals in travelling circuses, 81% were in favour of a ban. And this work echoes the results of the Scottish Government's recent survey in conjunction with Young Scott, the clear majority of young people in Scotland that responded to our survey uh, showed 80% in favour of the prohibition. The second area of ethical concern is the impact of the travelling circus life on wild animals. In response to the 2014 consultation, 
Over 90% of respondents considered that the ability of wild animals to undertake natural behaviours was compromised in the travelling circus environment. Many regard this as morally wrong, regardless of whether or not the animals can be proven to suffer, as it compromises the integrity of their wild nature and therefore their well-being. Third is the balance between ethical costs and wider benefits. I know that there are other types of animal use that cause concern about the, uh, cause concern about the environment in which animals are kept, how far they are transported, or what act they are being asked to perform. However, despite a range of individual views on the ethical challenges of other uses, it is generally accepted that there are clear benefits to be obtained from conservation of exotic species and from food production. These benefits are generally assumed to balance out the ethical costs involved. A query has been raised in the committee's report about why the bill only addresses travelling circuses. I believe that the use of wild animals in travelling circuses is unique amongst all other uses. It is the only situation that raises significant ethical concerns in all three areas that I have outlined. Other types of animal use could give rise to unease in one or two areas of ethical concern, but not all three. The bill before you will not stop the use of domestic animals like dogs and horses in travelling circuses or the use of wild animals in displays in static circuses, zoos or at public gatherings. Penguin parades at zoos, birds of prey demonstrations at fairs and reindeer displays will not be affected. The use of wild animals in TV and film production will not be affected. The programme for government does include a commitment to develop new licensing requirements to protect the welfare of wild and domesticated animals used for public performance or display, which would address a number of these other uses. And this will replace the somewhat dated Performing Animals Act 1925. So I'd now like to address some of the issues raised uh, in this report. The committee's report is concerned about the definition of a wild animal. However, the definition in the draft bill is both clear and easily understood and has been so since at least 1981 and the Zoo Licensing Act. This definition of a wild animal includes two parts a requirement of that kind of animal to not be domesticated, and equally as important, a requirement to not be commonly domesticated in the British Islands. Even if a circus were to argue that in their opinion their lions or tigers had become domesticated across successive generations of use, such animals would still be caught by the ban as they are clearly not commonly domesticated in the British Islands. Furthermore, I do not believe that including a definitive list of wild animals covered by the bill would be either proportionate or effective in addressing the aims of, bill, of the bill. Nevertheless, I will seek to provide ministers with the power to create secondary legislation subject to the affirmative procedure in which particular kinds of animals can or cannot be classified as wild or commonly domesticated in the British Isles for the purposes of this bill. And this power could be used in a targeted manner in any unforeseeable cases of genuine doubt in the future. The committee has also expressed particular concern about the definition of circus in the bill. An ordinary meaning allows for flexibility and common sense at both the enforcement stage and at the prosecution stage. A specific definition by its very nature is frozen in time and it risks capturing or excluding unintended enterprises because of its rigidity. It can also provide a clear signpost to the potential loopholes caused by that rigidity. We mustn't be naive. Listing the constituent parts also lays out a path to circumvent the ban. With circus, uh, there is a common public understanding about what that means. In the 2014 consultation, the respondents didn't have any difficulty understanding the word. And it is the word that is commonly used in other legislation uh, uh, that covers areas here. And I, I strongly believe that this is the approach most likely to achieve the purpose of this bill. And in the meantime, my officials will continue to engage with stakeholders to draft guidance for the bill. This should, I believe, be sufficient to allay unfounded fears around the definition and the danger of it being misinterpreted to include what are clearly not travelling circus activities. I hope that these opening remarks uh, explain why we are taking this important, proportionate and simple bill forward. Uh, this bill seeks to prohibit a singular practice that is morally objectionable to the people of Scotland. It seeks to do no more and no less. There is a more detailed government response available uh, for people to consider uh, that I think most committee members will have had referred to them uh, earlier uh, today. Uh, but, presiding officer, I move uh, that the Parliament now agrees.
to the general principles of the Wild Animals in Travelling Circuses Scotland Bill. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. I now call on Graham Day on behalf of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. Convener, seven minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. And can I say I'm delighted to speak in this debate on behalf of the committee. Can I thank the members of the committee for their efforts in producing a unanimous report on the bill, all the stakeholders who gave evidence and the clerks to the committee. The committee recommends the general principles to Parliament and is supportive of the aims of the bill. However, the committee believes the bill will only achieve these aims if several key concerns are addressed. Let me explore the specifics of those concerns and react insofar as I can to the government's recently received response to these. The most significant of the concerns related to the definitions within the bill. The bill defines a wild animal as an animal other than one of a kind that is commonly domesticated in the British Islands. The bill also provides a definition of domesticating, suggesting an animal is domesticated if the behaviour life cycle or physiology of animals of that kind has been altered as a result of the breeding or living conditions of multiple generations of animals of that kind being under human control. The committee believes it would be helpful if the definition of wild animal in section 2 could be made clearer. The Scottish Government suggested a flexible definition was appropriate and evidence to the committee and this was supported by some stakeholders. However, local authorities and circus operators felt the classification as domesticated or otherwise was open to interpretation. Local authorities also suggested there may be circumstances in which veterinary assistance would be required to classify an animal in order to ascertain whether an offence had been committed. While the committee accepts flexibility can be helpful in some circumstances, it did not believe operators or local authorities should be in any doubt as to what would be considered a wild animal. The definition of domestication was also the subject of debate within the committee's consideration of the bill. Those in opposition of the bill suggested animals living in circus environments could be domesticated and therefore not covered by the bill due to the changes in their behaviour developed through rearing and captivity, especially where this had taken place over several generations. Similarly, those in support of the bill proposed this definition to be removed so as not to suggest that domestication could be achieved from captive breeding and rearing over time alone. The fact such views exist persuaded the committee that some further reflection and consideration might be worthwhile in order to nail down what is and isn't a wild animal. The committee also felt the rationale behind admitting a list of animals covered should be revisited by the government. The committee suggested such a list would provide clarity and where the process is right could be updated to react to unforeseen circumstances. I note the Cabinet Secretary's comments in our formal response to the committee and again this afternoon and I welcome our willingness to at least explore an amendment to provide a regulation making power to include or exclude animals which become the subject of genuine doubt uh, in future as to whether they are wild. Members will, though I am sure, wish to reflect on her wider response in this area in due course. Continue with the themes of definitions, perhaps the elephant in the room here, and I suspect that won't be the last pun we hear this afternoon, was the omission of a definition of circus. While a definition of what constitutes a travelling circus is included, this is undermined without a clear idea of what is meant by circus. The bill has been introduced to address the public's ethical concerns about the use of wild animals in travelling circuses. The most recent enterprise to visit Scotland, the display whilst wintering of lions and tigers from a show only containing lions and tigers, which the public reaction to was picked up on by the Scottish Government, is, in the view of the committee, perhaps not currently covered by the bill. Similarly, the committee received several representations from stakeholders from both sides of the debate that ambiguity could lead to the bill being made to apply uh, to enterprises beyond those intended, particularly due to the application uh, of the ethical argument for the bill to other animal acts. The committee believes the bill should be clear as to what acts will be covered. The committee heard evidence from Scottish Government officials suggesting that the term circus would be interpreted by courts using the Oxford English dictionary definition, which includes reference to elements such as a circular arena uh, and acrobatic performances. The committee was also told the omission of any one of these elements could mean an act using wild animals would not be considered a circus. The ordinary or commonly understood definition was advocated in evidence to the committee. Not only does the committee believe the reliance on such a definition potentially opens the door to the bill's purpose being undermined, but it also considers this approach to be uh, to legislating to be unsatisfactory. The law should be clear for both participants and enforce, enforcers without immediate recourse to legal challenge. Let me pose a scenario. 
Let's say that a show containing only lions and tigers was set up within a non-circular cage inside a series of major exhi uh, exhibition arena, and there were no horses or no acrobats involved, would that, beyond doubt, be captured by the bill? The committee has re recommended a definition of circus to be included in the face of the bill. However, I welcome, as I'm sure the committee will, the commitment given both to producing a company and guidance which would provide examples of what is a circus and to at least consider amendments brought forward defining a circus in a way that does not inadvertently capture the likes of birds of prey displays or festive reindeer or indeed allow for affected circus uh, enterprises to modify their offering in order to circumvent the ban. On a company and guidance, though, the committee proposed this be ready as soon as the bill is passed, so there's no point at which legislation is in place with local authorities having supporting clarity. I wonder if the CABSEC might be able to confirm the intention in that regard in due course. Evidence to the committee suggested the definition of circus operators could be extended to reflect the everyday hierarchies and employment scenarios that work in circuses. Uh, again, having received the government's response to the report only last night, I think members will want time to reflect upon the comments contained mm -hmm. within a, around this aspect. Other issues that were covered by the report, uh, while definitions occupied most of the evidence received on the substance of the bill, there were also proposals explored with local authorities on possible additional enforcement powers. The committee proposed there be, these be considered by the government. The government has provided a detailed response on this, which members individually and perhaps collectively will come to a view on. Represent representations were also made to the committee on potential wider impacts of the bill on the entertainment industry. The committee received evidence suggesting moves to restrict the use of wild animals and travelling circuses could have an impact on, for example, Scotland's attractiveness as a filming location. Um, the committee has highlighted this evidence in its stage one report. The cabinet secretary's acknowledgement of the, the validity of such concerns insofar as, she, insofar as she will issue additional clarifying guidance and reiterating that the bill is intended to capture only travelling circus is again helpful. Uh, while I've focused mainly on the substance of the bill, uh, can I turn briefly, presiding officer, uh, to looking at the issue of further legislation in the yes, area? Yes, we have a little form? time in hand. Thank you. Um, in the area of performing animals by way of conclusion. The uh, Cabinet Secretary wrote to the committee on the day the bill was introduced to highlight the intention to review the operation of the Performing Animals Regulation Act 1925. While this is welcome, there remain concerns about whether introducing this bill in isolation rather than including it within a more comprehensive approach was the best approach. Similarly, we sought assurances that at the end of this whole process, there would be no gaps in clarity as to whether the use of wild animals in static circuses was to be addressed. The detail offered in response, indicating new licensing requirements are planned to protect the welfare of wild and domesticated animals used in public performance or display, other than in zoos, which will cover static circuses, is again to be welcomed, as is the confirmation that a consultation will be undertaken and the affirmative process used. Finally, the committee believes the decision to frame the bill on an ethical basis has been difficult to justify, particularly in light of evidence which would have supported a welfare-based approach. The committee does not question the value of the ethical arguments against the use of wild animals in travelling circuses, but it does not consider that these have been well utilised and, as I have stated, believes the wisdom of what was described as a piecemeal approach could be questioned. However, that does not detract from the fact the committee supports the aims of the bill. Member must wind up. I'm sorry, Cabinet Secretary, you're, well, you're over. Could we up? That's a fearsome look you're giving me, Cabinet Secretary. I'll, I think we really must. Okay. Excuse I, me a minute. I'm conferring. Can you give a, brief a brief intervention, but you'll have to wind up very quickly after I'm that. So, I'm, Cabinet I'm Secretary. I just would like to ask my colleague if he seriously would have preferred that all of this have been delayed for a number of years more, because that's the consequence of what he is saying there. And briefly, convener. Uh, very briefly, as the Cabinet Secretary knows, I'm reflecting the views of the whole committee, not just my own. I do take that point on board. However, it is a view that the committee unanimously reached. Can I just conclude, President Officer, by saying that regardless of what the report says, this does not detract from the fact the committee supports the aims of the bill and looks forward to further working with the Scottish Government to ensure that those aims can be delivered as effectively as possible. Presiding officer. Thank you very much. Uh, I now call Don, Donald Cameron to open for the Conservatives. Five minutes, please, Mr Cameron. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'd like to begin this afternoon by commending the report of the committee and the comments of the convener, uh, which we have just heard. The Scottish Conservatives will be supporting the government's motion, and I'd like to reiterate many of the points the convener has already made. However, before I do so, I feel it is necessary to point out 
that it is customary for the government to respond in writing to the committee's report prior to a stage one debate. And such a letter did arrive in my email inbox uh, shortly after nine o'clock this morning. But with the greatest respect, a 14-page letter with detailed points being made in it, arriving a mere six hours or so before the debate, is insufficient. The failure of the government to give adequate notice of their position, which committee members can then analyse and scrutinise properly, respects neither the committee nor the wider work of this parliament. And given we are operating to a timetable on this bill driven by the government, not by the committee, to have a stage one debate with only the committee report to go on and limited time to digest the government's lengthy response means this debate is inevitably prejudiced. And I, for one, simply have not had time over the course of today to go through the government's letter in detail. That aside, can I say the following? First, can I assure the Chamber that the Scottish Conservatives are committed to the highest standards of animal welfare. We are clear that those who abuse and inflict cruelty on animals should be punished in accordance with the law. The Scottish Conservatives support a ban on the use of wild animals in travelling circuses on ethical and animal welfare grounds. We do not believe that the majority of the public are either comfortable or satisfied with this ongoing practice, albeit there is no evidence that such a practice is currently underway in Scotland at this time. The Wild Animals in Travelling Circuses Bill was discussed on the 27th of June uh, this year during a meeting of the committee. And from a personal perspective, uh, I, I did not join the committee till after that date, and so was not there in person, but my colleagues, Finlay Carson and Maurice Gold and Alexander Burnett were present. At that meeting, Conservative members of the committee made it clear to the Cabinet Secretary that legislation in the bill did not go far enough in tackling the welfare of wild animals in travelling circuses, but in static ones too. Moving on to the bill itself, we are supportive of the principles behind the bill. However, it does, I regret to say, require much improvement. Broad criticisms of the bill include that it risks criminalising shows and events which have a good track record of animal welfare. Many examples have been given, but reindeers at Christmas markets, falconry displays, llamas at the Royal Highland Show, etc. This is a major concern across the country, but it's particularly a concern to those of us who represent rural areas where agricultural shows, Highland Games, are often part of the lifeblood of the summer economy. And I know the Cabinet Secretary has been trenchant in her views on this, in committee and again today, but I would venture that the bill does not give similar comfort. If I could concentrate on a couple of areas, I'd like to raise the issue of legal definitions. I have to say I can almost sense former colleagues in the legal profession rubbing their hands at the prospect of this legislation and the interpretative issues it will throw up in its present state. Strangely, for a bill all about circuses, the bill chooses not to define the word circus. Now, on the one hand, as the Cabinet Secretary has said, there is sense sometimes in a general, flexible definition, but not here, I would submit. Not only that, but the bill does then go on to define travelling circus, albeit the word circus, within that phrase, travelling circus, is not defined. Travelling circus is currently defined as the public's perception of a travelling circus, which is vague, open to all sorts of interpretations, and risk criminalising those who put on a show event where animals have to be transported to the event. And it does, in my view, leave anyone trying to comprehend the bill in great difficulty. Another issue is the term wild animal. Currently, the definition of wild animal is not an animal commonly domesticated in the UK. But where does that leave the reindeer from Scandinavia or llamas from South America, who would be classed as a wild animal and could thus be banned from being on show at public events? Given the issues here, I do urge the government to consider whether having a defined list containing detailed species, which the government, by secondary legislation, can add to or subtract from at will, would be a more sensible way forward. It might avoid some of the issues that my colleagues on the committee have mentioned and I'm sure will go on to mention. But in closing, unlike the Foreign Secretary, I'm going to withstand the temptation to make reference to a roaring lion. But I would like to be clear that we accept we must have robust legislation in place to ensure wild animals are properly protected. We welcome the creation of the offence. We support the overarching principles of this bill. But the legislation needs serious work before it is in a fit state to be enacted.
Thank you very much, Mr Cameron. I hope we've run out of references to animals. Probably not. I call David Stewart. Have I just sabotaged something? I call yes. David Stewart to open on behalf of Labour. Five minutes, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and I rise to speak in support of the general principles of the Bill. Uh, however, as a member of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee, there are a number of recommendations proposed which will, in my view, improve the Bill at Stage 2. And as with uh, comments made by Don Carman, I've only just received the Cabinet Secretary's response to the Committee's recommendations, so I've not had the opportunity to assess fully uh, the Government's potential position at Stage 2. Nevertheless, there are a number of key strands which other speakers referred to, animal welfare versus ethics, the scope of the Bill, the definitions, and of enforcement. And animal welfare organisations, such as the well-respected uh, One Kind, believe that there are strong animal welfare justifications for a ban on the use of wild animals in travelling circuses. In their public petition to the Parliament, they say, and I quote, President Officer, a travelling circus combines a number of specific characteristics, including extreme confinement, frequent transport and relocation, and training for performance, which creates an environment where the needs of wild animals cannot be met. This combination is not found elsewhere, even in zoos where wild animals are kept captive. It increases the risk of stress, and in some cases, ill treatment of the animals and makes effective inspection and regulation very difficult. Now, investigation into UK circuses in recent years have documented shocking examples of severe habitual abuse of animals. For example, in 1999, individuals from the Tripperfield Circus were found guilty of cruelty to a chimpanzee and an elephant, whilst in 2009, in the Great British Circus, the beating of elephants prior to performance was filmed by the Andable Defenders International 2009. And earlier this year, a further expose by the same organisation showed an aged arthritic elephant named Dan being repeatedly beaten and abused by a member of staff in the Bobby Roberts Super Circus. And video footage also showed a camel being spat up while tethered in its stall. Both of these animals have now been rehomed, but prior to this, they were regularly brought on tour to Scotland. The elephant was too old to perform traditional tricks, but was used for photographs in the circus ring and the camel was also exhibited after performances. Now, around half of Scottish local authorities have a policy of not letting public land to circuses with wild animals. But the same circuses were shown to have used the wild animals in defiance of specific licensing or license condition opposed by some councils. But, President Officer, since the time of the public petition, an authoritative review we heard from the Cabinet Secretary of the Animal Welfare Issues in Doring has been published by the Welsh Government and was referred to several times in the course of evidence to our committee. And in its 2014 consultation, the Scottish Government acknowledged the strength of public concern about animal welfare and the strong body of opinion that the animals' five welfare needs, as set out in the Animal Health and Welfare Scotland Act 2006, could not be catered for in wild animals within a travelling circus environment. Now, other speakers, presiding officer, talked about definitions, and I want to say a little bit about that as well. The Scottish Government's position is that anyone enforcing legislation would know what a circus was, and the courts would be well placed to interpret this if there was any doubt. However, I note the points made by local authorities as regard enforcement activities where the court process is only the culmination of the process. So council officers need to have a clear basis for initiating action and must feel confident the legislation is applicable uh, before they act. Now, the discussion in the committee, as we've heard, referred to the Oxford English Dictionary and the involvement of acrobats, clowns and other entertainers. But this could cause confusion to anyone seeking to rely on the Scottish Parliament proceedings for an interpretation. Under these circumstances, I endorse what the convener's points it would be necessary to place a definition of circus in the face of the bill. Now, moving on to wild animals, uh, the definition in the Dangerous Wild Animals Act 1974 provides an interesting starting point, but would require refinement. The current definition of wild animal is one that's not commonly domesticated in the British Isles, which accords with existing definitions in the Manual Health and Welfare Scotland Act 2006 and the Zoo Licenses Act 1981. However, the definition of the domesticated in section 2.2 is unclear and requires amendment. Domestication is a process that takes hundreds of thousands of years, and this is not generally reflected in the concept of multiple generations um, of animals. Conscious of time, President Officer, in winding up, uh, I will say that local authorities need to be sourced to deliver on their welfare powers, although not be able uh, to use them effectively. 
But in conclusion, Mr. Iden, officer, I believe this bill is the right direction for animal welfare. I urge the government to bring forward improvements at the bill in stage two, reflecting the clear committee's recommendation. But I support the general principles of the bill. Thank you. Thank you very much. Move to the open debate. Speeches of four minutes. And there's one member who's down to speak who's forgotten to press the request to speak button. I'm not naming them. Uh, I call Emma Harper to be followed by Peter Chapman. Ms. Harper. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, I am a member of the committee which is responsible for um, scrutinising this bill. And I thank the members and the clerks and everyone else involved for the work that they've put into this. The Scottish Government has put forward an argument for the ban of wild animals and travelling circuses using ethical grounds. And that's outlined in the policy memorandum. And I support the Scottish Government's bill. It's the ethical arguments that I'm going to focus on today. The three areas that have been suggested that have ethical implications are the impact of respect for animals, impact of traveling environments on an animal's nature or behavior, and the ethical costs versus the benefits. There's also the argument that of the five freedoms developed by the Farm Animal Welfare Council, the fourth and fifth freedoms, the freedom to express normal behaviour and the freedom from fear and distress is where the ethical concern lies. First, when considering the impact of the travelling component of a circus, a travelling circus, we must consider the stress and trauma to the animals of being coerced out of one environment, the environment they are normally in, loaded into a vehicle, into a strange alternative environment. The further stress and fear of the travelling itself, the movement, the vibration, the noise, the lights, the smells. When giving evidence at the committee, the SSPCA's Mike Flynn stated that the loading and unloading of animals was the issue that caused the stress. And the requirements to secure animals, especially big cats, to keep the animals safe and the public safe from any potential escape is also a concern. I struggle to see how any of this could satisfy the freedom to express normal behaviour and the freedom from fear and distress. The second ethical concern, the circus aspect, is, the right, is it right and respectful to coax, coerce, train and tame wild beasts to perform for human entertainment or amusement? If it is not normal behaviour for wild animals to perform for humans under the direction of another human, in committee, I asked the Cabinet Secretary the question, is it just time that we stop having wild animals like tigers and lions in circuses? And that is the last aspect I will speak about today. The same question, is it time? There was a time about 100 years ago when a wee lass who grew up in Stranraer, like I did, who would have no way of seeing wild animals like lions or tigers except for something like a travelling circus. There was no television, there was no internet 100 years ago, there was no David Attenborough DVDs. This is no longer the case in 2017. I struggle to see the ethical costs outweighing the potential educational benefits. There is already a history of stopping display or exhibition in circuses based on ethical grounds. We no longer display Siamese twins in circuses conjoined twins. We no longer display or exhibit the wolf man or the bearded lady. That's a medical condition called hypertrichosis. We no longer display persons with birth defects like Joseph Merrick, known around the world as the elephant man. There was a time that people like Joseph Merrick were displayed in travelling circuses for the amazement, amusement and entertainment of paying customers. But eventually the time came when this archaic practice was no longer acceptable ethically. I welcome this bill. Presiding officer, I get it. I get the ethical argument. I get the fact that restricting the freedom to exhibit normal behaviour, which is what happens in a travelling circus environment, is not ethical, whether that animal is a lion, tiger, elephant, or any other wild animal. Wild animals should not be tamed, trained, or otherwise coerced to perform for the amusement of human beings. It is unethical, and it's time to stop it. 19 countries have already implemented a ban on no, having No, I'm afraid one. you must conclude. OK, I will conclude, presiding officer. 19 countries have banned it, so it's time Scotland can lead the way <laughs> for the rest of the UK. Ah. Sometimes I don't win. Uh, I call Peter Chapman to be followed by Claire Adamson. Mr Chapman, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And uh, the debate today is about wild animals, so for once I don't need to declare an interest. <laughs> 
<laughs> Nevertheless, when I'm in a pen with a newly carved coup, I sometimes think I'd be better off with a lion, to be honest. <laughs> but then, officer, I do wonder why this bill is being pushed through Parliament just now, as Scotland has not seen a travelling circus using wild animals for many years, and there is no real possibility that we will see one any time soon. Nevertheless, I do welcome this bill and support its principle that a circus should not be allowed to use wild animals as performance pieces. And although I welcome the, what this bill is trying to do, there are far too many loopholes and lack of clear definitions. It is poorly drafted and simply not fit for purpose. One of my main concerns with the current bill is that it may criminalize shows and events that display animals yet have good records of animal welfare and are ethically sound. I know many local businesses that this may concern. For example, the Eithen Bank Reindeer Park in Ellen allowed children to visit Santa's real reindeer during the festive season. And in May, alpacas from a farm in Fife traveled to Dundee University for students to visit as part of a de-stressing exercise to emphasize the importance of maintaining good mental health. Will all these traveling and seasonal events be impacted by this legislation? And unless it is amended and provides more detail and clarity in its poorly defined terms as to what is a wild animal, I believe they are all at risk. The bill defines the term wild animal as an animal other than one of a kind that is commonly domesticated in British islands. And I believe this is open to interpretation. The RSPCA is able to define wild animals used in circuses when it states some circuses in Britain currently tour with wild animals including zebras, lions, snakes, tigers and camels. I believe the Scottish Government has a duty to take note and list the animals which the bell seeks to protect. The bell should not be subject to interpretation. It needs to be much more clearly defined. The bell provides no clear definition of the term travelling circus either, leaving the debate to fall back to the public's and layman's perception of a travelling circus. Again, this should not be subject to interpretation. There is also no mention of static circuses, Yet another loophole which will see this bill failing animals should a static circus be set up in Scotland. President officer, the current bill also fails to address the issue of transportation. There is nothing in it to stop travelling circuses moving through Scotland as long as they do not perform. For example, they could, they could travel through Scotland to get a ferry to Ireland. I agree with the committee that the bill as drafted does not fully address the issues it, is, it has proposed to cover and is at risk of capturing animal, animal performances and shows it may not have intended to. It is vital that the government address these issues. It is government's job to set clear legislation which does what it sets out to do, not one with loopholes and definitions that are subject to public perception. It is lazy and unacceptable. The government needs to do better for the clear benefit of the animals it wishes to protect. Thank you, Mr Chapman. I call Claire Adamson, followed by Colin Smith. Ms Adamson, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, as an elected parliamentarian councillor, I um, was pleased with the links that I've made over the years with the Showman's Guild. I've attended their annual lunch on a number of occasions to hear about their history, traditions and commitment to the entertainment of our communities. On one occasion, I was thrilled to discover that the grandfather of my host had been at a lion tamer in London. And I say thrilled because it conjured feeling of the unexpected, the bizarre, the amazing, the exotic. As the granddaughter of a steel worker, I was suddenly within touching distance of a romantic, dangerous, alien history, a lifestyle that was only of my storybooks and imaginings as a child, but so real to the families of the Showman Guild. I pictured Muska-esque billboards with ringmasters in fabulous redder-than-redder -redder jackets, cartoon-like strongmen, and exotic animal displays. Images that are thankfully memories of a bygone era. At Showman's Guild's Fair today, you won't even find a goldfish in a bag as a prize. Because that was of another era, our values have changed, as my colleague Emma Harper so eloquently outlined, 
The thrills and exhibits of the past are no longer have the taste, the tolerance of modern society. And documentaries such as Blackfish have altered their views on animal, uh, animal displays and captivity and the ethical use of animals. Not a member of the committee, I would like to thank them for the substantive work on stage one of the bill and I'm delighted that they support the general principles of the bill. But I would like to drill down in one of the many areas examined by the committee in the meaning of wild, wild animals. I think it's extremely important that going forward we get this right. My interest in this area comes from the work of Russian geneticist Dmitry Baliev. Baliev have hypothesised that the anatomical and physiological changes seen in domesticated animals could have been the result of selection based on behavioural traits. He conducted an experiment on silver foxes over 40 generations of the animal um, where they selected animals based on temperament for the breeding process but also had a control group. They rated each fox's tendency to approach an examiner standing in front of its home pen and watched each fox's tendency to bite or um, be aggressive towards the experimenter. And they were able to breed out these traits and tame the animals. But that was done with less than a fifth of the individuals being selected with that trait for breeding. There were changes to the look, the the appearance and the behaviour of the animals that were bred um, to be domesticated. They wagged their tails, they were happy and excited to see people. Further, their fear response to new people and objects was reduced. The first physiological change detected was the, in the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, the system that is responsible for the control of adrenaline, which is a hormone that is produced in response to stress and controls fear-related responses. The domesticated foxes had a significantly lower adrenal level. I bring this to the chamber because I, I do think this explains and um, uh, informs us about what domestication means as opposed to taming. Animals that have not been selected for bed from a very, very small group, obviously, um, such as animals that are held in circuses, it's such a small group of animals that have made those genetic changes that took hundreds of thousands of years in domesticated breeds such as dogs. To my mind, um, I don't think those genetic and um, biological changes can possibly have made in those animals. They are wild animals and should be considered such. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much, Ms Adamson. I call Colin Smith to be followed by Mark Ruskell, please, Mr Smith. Thank you, President Officer. As your deputy uh, on the cross-party group on animal welfare, it's a, it's a privilege to speak in a debate that I hope will take Scotland a step forward in ending the cruelty and distress inflicted on animals in travelling circus, circuses. And later today, I hope we'll be unanimous in our vote for the principles of the bill so we can progress to a more detailed consideration and, crucially, to amendment. This week was the birthday of one of the, the greatest practitioners of non-violence, Mahatma Gandhi. He didn't distinguish who included in that non-violence and one said, the greatness of a nation and its moral progress can be judged by the way its animals are treated. Well, presiding officer, there's nothing great about the treatment of animals in a travelling circus, either from an ethical or animal welfare point of view. The animals are faced with cramped and restrictive accommodation without the space to recreate their natural behaviour, to explore, to socialise, to find food as they would in the wild. From stress to ligament damage to disease, the behavioural, psychological and physical impact of those conditions have on animals is absolutely clear, as is the impact of the work the animals are forced to do in order to perform. So-called tricks are, are learned through intensive training with many well-documented instances of trainers using abuse and negative reinforcement. And the performances themselves with the presence of human audiences often cause distress to the animals. Now I'm sure we're all aware of examples of this in our own constituencies and region and for the benefit of Peter Chapman not that long ago. Although I didn't attend, I remember Bobby Roberts' Super Circus tour in Dumfries and Galloway with her aged athletic elephant Anne, mentioned earlier by Dave Stewart. Taken from the world in Sri Lanka, Anne was used for entertainment for over 50 years, right up until 2011, when her last trick was to stand and pose for photographs with audience members for five pounds a time, before she was eventually rehomed after protests at the appalling treatment she received. It's an example that shows that existing regulation or monitoring in the industry didn't and doesn't work, and without a full ban, the mistreatment of animals like Anne is inevitable. It's a view that appears to have overwhelming support. The public consultation for this bill showed that 98% of respondents supported a ban on travelling circuses 
keeping at wild animals for performance, and 96% believe that a ban is the only way to end this cruelty. Respondents were clear in their comments about the physical and psychological cruelty animals are subjected to, describing it as archaic and barbaric. So this bill is a positive step towards relegating this cruelty to the history books. However, I very much commend the work of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee in highlighting problematic definitions and potential loopholes and ultimately for the need for the bill to be strengthened. And I welcome their 20 recommendations in their report. In particular, I echo their calls for the bill to include a list of animals covered by the legislation, which can be easily updated and amended to ensure that ambiguity over the distinction between domesticated and wild animals does not prevent the bill from working as intended. I'd also reiterate the importance of not only making enforcement of the bill statutory, but taking steps to ensure that local authorities have resources to enforce it. Concerns were expressed to the committee by council officials about the practicality of enforcement, and Mike Flynn of the SSPCA expressed his doubt over whether enforcement powers would be used. The discretionary aspect of enforcement should be removed, but if the burden of enforcement is to be devolved to local authorities, they must also receive the necessary resources. So I hope the Scottish Government will accept the changes proposed to the bill by the committee so we have a thorough and robust ban. I understand the Government have now responded to the committee, but that was only a few hours ago. And for those members that are not a member of the committee, we haven't seen that particular response. Presiding officer, in concluding, this bill is a step in the right direction for animal welfare, but it is one, I say in all sincerity, which is badly needed. Because the failure of the government to ban electronic shock devices, to consult on a ban on snaring, the recent decision to reintroduce tail docking, concerns that the government will not go beyond Lord Bonamy's recommendations and ensure a proper ban on hunting, all seriously undermine the credibility of the government when it comes to animal welfare. And we badly need steps like this bill if our moral progress as a nation is indeed to be judged in a positive light. Thank you. I call Mark Ruskell to be followed by Liam McCarthy. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. And as a member of the committee, can I also join the convener in thanking all the stakeholders who gave evidence and the clerks. I think you did a great job herding the evidence into another excellent report for the committee. Um, now, this should be a victorious moment because banning wild animals and circuses, circuses is absolutely the right thing to do on both ethical and animal welfare grounds. And I think Emma Harper really nailed that ethical argument well in her speech. And of course, Green MSPs will be backing this bill at stage one. And in fact, I, I moved an amendment myself to the Animal Health and Welfare Bill over a decade ago that would have introduced uh, a ban then, except it was only supported at the time, um, curiously, by SNP members. So it's long needed and long overdue. But what should be a moment of celebration with this bill, with this bill feels more like a headache because of some of the poor drafting. And I think many of us in committee who started with very different positions on this bill have actually ended up sharing some of the same grounds for concern. So let's take two of the most fundamental definitions. What is a circus and what is a wild animal? We heard from the officials in evidence to committee that, and I quote, if it looks like a circus, walks like a circus and talks like a circus, then it is a circus. And also that we shouldn't expect people to overthink the definition of a circus. Except, of course, there are people who are paid exactly to do that, called lawyers. One performance act with lions and ti tigers we heard from certainly talked like a circus when he gave evidence to the committee, but no one can actually tell him if he is a circus under the bill because he doesn't have a tent or clowns. So simply leaving it for the courts to decide is not good enough. And on the definition of a wild animal, again, there needs to be much more clarity. The word domesticated is unhelpful and could be used by circus operators to argue that animals evolved over millions of years in the wild are actually domesticated because they've lived in captive training environments for several generations. Certainly the taxonomy required to add a list of wild animals to the bill wouldn't be hard to do. It doesn't have to name every individual wild animal on planet Earth. But given that there's been more than a decade since the wild animals in circus issue was raised, I am perplexed as to why the Scottish Government has not followed the route of the Welsh Government in updating legislation for all animal performances at the same time, of which travelling circuses are really just one type. Now, this would have addressed the problem the Bill has in targeting the plight of wild animals in travelling circuses while simply ignoring those in static circuses. We also heard contradictory evidence from the Cabinet Secretary about the importance of the travelling environment as an ethical concern rather than an animal welfare issue, which had us, quite frankly, chasing our tails. Surely it would have been better to just bring in a proper framework 
that places each type of animal performance into a category of either ban it, regulate it further, or just leave it alone. The ethical basis to this bill was based on public concerns about circuses as the top issue, except there was no consultation or polling conducted to understand the public's views on greyhound racing, for example. Yet these and many other types of animal performance raise ethical and welfare questions of varying degrees that need to be addressed. Presiding officer, in conclusion, there is much for the government to do to make this bill look like a ban, walk like a ban, and talk like a ban, and I look forward to amendments at stage two. Call Liam MacArthur to be followed by Angus MacDonald. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. Can I um, start by thanking Graham Day and his uh, committee colleagues on the Eclair Committee for the work that they've uh, done. Uh, obviously, I recognise the overwhelming support uh, now in favour of ban on the use of wild animals in uh, circuses, and certainly the Scottish Liberal Democrats will uh, gladly support the general principles of this bill uh, later on this evening. So we welcome the bill, but believe, as many others have already identified, that there is room and considerable scope for improvement in this uh, proposed legislation. The committee has very helpfully uh, highlighted a number of those areas. And while um, the minister, the cabinet secretary, in, in her remarks reiterated um, the, the basis uh, for the approach being taken in terms of a ban on, on, on ethical grounds. Uh, and while there are clearly ethical reasons for such a ban, I think the committee is right to draw, uh, dr raise awareness about the, uh, the, the shortcomings of that uh, approach. And, and an ethical basis is difficult to justify in light of the evidence uh, which would support a welfare-based approach. The BVA uh, remind us that the welfare of these animals is emblematic of the way we treat all animals uh, under the care of humans and I think uh, at stage two when the detailed scrutiny of this legislation uh, gets underway uh, in earnest I think there is considerable work still to be done in that uh, in that regard similarly more work uh, I believe is needed to be done uh, to address the ethical and welfare considerations arising out of the use of wild animals in static circuses again a, p a point picked up by Mark Ruskell uh, and others notwithstanding the points made by the cabinet secretary in her uh, opening uh, comments the Scottish Government relied on the premise that ethical objections to the use of wild animals in travelling circuses uh, did not apply to the same extent to other types of animals, uh, or other types of animal performance or display. And I think the Minister may be justified in this uh, assertion, but to date I don't think uh, there is enough evidence being set out clearly and compellingly. But perhaps the area that uh, colleagues uh, on the committee and, and for those reading the committee's report have drawn uh, most attention to is the problem uh, around many of the, the definitions, whether the definition of circus, circus operator, uh, wild uh, animals. Uh, I know the, the Cabinet Se Secretary sought to try to offer reassurance again in her, in her opening remarks, uh, but I think uh, it does look like uh, we are opening up within the, uh, the bill at the moment uh, a bit of a paradise uh, for lawyers rather than suitable and appropriate protection uh, for uh, animals in, in circuses. Uh, these issues of, of definition are critical uh, in terms of getting them right, not least, as uh, I think David Stewart and others emphasised, the need to ensure that local authorities uh, uh, who are left enforcing these new, new restrictions do indeed have the clarity that they require. Um, as I say, uh, we do not want to get to the point of these, um, these issues being challenged in court, and that will very much fall to, to local authorities in the, the first instance, whether this is on the face of the bill, whether it's, uh, these are issues to be dealt with in subsequent guidance, I do think it's an area where perhaps most of the work um, that needs to be done at stage two uh, will be focused. But in conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, while improvements are needed, uh, this bill and the proposals it seeks to bring forward are indeed welcome. I think they reflect our values as a society and the importance we attach to the high standards of animal welfare we want to see. And so I look forward to supporting the general principles of this bill uh, at decision uh, time later on this evening. Thank you. Call Angus MacDonald to be followed by John Scott. Uh, thank you, President Officer. As a member of the Clare Committee, I'm pleased to contribute to this afternoon's debate, not least because it's a further step towards seeing Scotland lead the way for the rest of the UK in tackling the important ethical issue of the use of wild animals in travelling circuses. And it's also welcome, given the use of wild animals in circuses has been the subject of deliberation by campaigners for decades, uh, with part of the existing framework dating back to the Performing Animals Regulation Act of 1925. Now, the Cabinet Secretary alluded to it in her opening remarks, but for the record, 
Uh, I think it should be noted, President Officer, that in March 2012, the UK Government announced it would bring forward primary legislation at the earliest opportunity to ban circuses from using wild animals on ethical grounds. However, as of this year, more than three years after the initial offer of a joint UK bill, no date has been set for a bill to be introduced to the UK Parliament. So it seems to have gone off the UK Government's radar. So we've heard contributions from members this afternoon covering a number of issues, including the need to tighten definitions within the bill, particularly with regard to the definition of a travelling circus and wild animals. And also the uh, ethical and welfare arguments have, have also been well aired uh, by members today. However, I'd like to concentrate on the issue of enforcement and the need to support local authorities in their enforcement duties. Uh, the committee in its stage one report is of the view that enforcement powers within the bill could go further, particularly given the evidence we took from local authorities who have called for additional powers to intervene to prevent shows from taking place. Basically, as drafted, the bill doesn't make it a statutory duty for local authorities to enforce the powers, so enforcement will effectively be discretionary. And I have to admit, uh, I have some difficulty with that, and I do wonder what the point of introducing this legislation is uh, if we do not remove the discretionary element of the local authority's enforcement duty. I do welcome, however, the assurance from the Cabinet Secretary when she gave evidence to the committee that any non-enforcement of the legislation by local authorities could be solved by ministers appointing their own inspectors. Uh, as the minister told the committee, and I quote, the bill as it stands does allow Scottish ministers some flexibility to appoint inspectors, so it will not be up to local authorities alone to, to do that and there is a power in the bill for ministers to appoint an alternative inspector if the Scottish Government think that certain local authorities are not enforcing the legislation. End of quote. Now, that would be fine if we weren't dealing with travelling circuses. Uh, as it says in the tin, they travel. So there's every possibility that by the time a Scottish Government appointed inspector is alerted to the non-enforcement by a local authority, then the travelling circus could have moved on. So I would urge the Cabinet Secretary to look again at this issue and consider the removal of the discretionary element of local authorities' enforcement duty. Um, in addition, President Officer, guidance is proposed to support local authorities in their enforcement duties, and the committee considers, given the importance of this document for interpretations, that this should be available to councils as soon as the Act is enacted, if this bill is passed. So, in closing, President Officer, I look forward to further consideration of this bill at Stage 2, in the hope that we can get this right by the time it reaches stage three, and once enacted, will enable the ban on wild animals and travelling circuses to be put into effect immediately after enactment, along with the appropriate guidance which has been called for by the committee. Thank you. John Scott, followed by Kate Forbes. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and may I begin by declaring an interest as an honorary member of the British Veterinary Association. And can I start by saying that the Scottish Conservative Party and I welcome the general principles of the Wild Animals and Travelling Circuses Scotland Bill. I know that the British Veterinary Association, One Kind and others, have campaigned for a ban on the use of wild animals in travelling circuses for many years, as they and we believe the needs of non-domesticated wild animals cannot be met within a travelling circus, particularly in terms of accommodation and the ability to express normal behaviour. The five welfare needs of animals as detailed in the Animal Health and Welfare Scotland Act 2006 is currently where our legislation in Scotland is benchmarked for the time being. And so in this stage one debate today, we seek to build on that position. That said, we note that after a review of 2007, which found a lack of evidence to support a science-based ban on the use of wild animals in travelling circuses, but note on the other hand, the Welsh Government Scientific Review post-2007, which concluded that captive wild animals in circuses and other travelling animals shows do not achieve their optimal welfare requirement. And while it is surprising that we in Scotland are relying on work carried out elsewhere in the United Kingdom to support this bill, this is probably because there are no wild animals in travelling circuses visiting Scotland now or likely to be in the foreseeable future. And so we move to the ethical case for the bill, which at best has been poorly made by the Scottish Government, notwithstanding Emma Harper's valiant attempts to do so today. 
when the real case to be made for such a ban is much easier to make on animal welfare grounds. And the government, in response to, to paragraph 130 of the report, tacitly acknowledges this by taking this bill forward much more sensibly on welfare grounds. So we must seek to inform this bill to make it fit for purpose, which it currently is not. So a travelling circus, as others have said, must be properly defined. And I welcome the government's intention to provide a guidance note for the bill, which will include guidance and examples around the definition of a circus. I also welcome the government's willingness to consider appropriate amendments on this definition, although I may leave that uh, possibility to final legal minds than mine, given the parameters the government has set for such an amendment being brought forward and accepted by the government. In addition, a list should be provided of wild animals on the face of the bill, which need not be exhaustive, but which should be indicative and which could be added to or subtracted from by statutory instrument as appropriate over the passage of time. So while I note and welcome the government's response, I would nonetheless urge the government to bring forward an appropriate amendment at stage two to create a list of wild animals. Presiding officer, where there is an opportunity for principles, policy and definition to be ex expressed clearly on the face of any bill, not just this one, that opportunity should be taken and as little as possible left to subordinate legislation. And it's my recollection that this is a view that the Cabinet Secretary herself also adheres to. In addition, local authorities need clear guidance as, the likely, as to the likely enforcement duties expected of them in this legislation. So I welcome the Government's response to paragraph 315 and 320 of the report. In particular, I welcome the intended level of discretion to be given to local authorities unlike my colleague Angus MacDonald, and the intention not to overburden local authorities with potentially extra expenses. So, presiding officer, while we support the general principles of this bill, there is still much work to be done to make it fit for purpose, but of course the Scottish Conservatives and Unionists will work constructively with the Scottish Government and others towards this goal. Thank you. The last of the open debate contributions comes from Kate Forbes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And it's great to have this debate in the Chamber after lengthy discussions in the Committee. We spent a number of hours taking evidence and discussing the Bill, and I can only presume that those who watched the live stream were tempted to whistle a mashup of Old MacDonald Had a Farm and In the Jungle, as we talked about sheep and cows and reindeer and llamas and camels and even ligers. That was courtesy of Emma Harper. But on to the, the very serious matter of the debate. It's clear that there was in the committee and there continues to be in this chamber unanimity um, in terms of support for the principles of the bill. And when it is passed, the bill will see Scotland leading the way for the rest of the UK in tackling the important ethical issue of the use of wild animals in travelling circuses. I'm pleased to follow a number of excellent speeches and others have said much of what I might have said, particularly highlighting their support, but also noting areas where they feel that the bill could be strengthened around definitions. So to avoid going over the same ground, I want to go back to basics and as the last of the open speakers, that will perhaps remind us why we're here in the first place. Briefly just recognising the work of Mark Ruskell and others 10 years ago then in proposing a similar ban and also to agree with Liam MacArthur's line that I do think this ban and our discussion around the use um, of animals in travelling circuses reflects our values as a society. The unanimity in the chamber, I think, recognises the broad consensus amongst the public in terms of um, a ban on wild animals and travelling circuses. The Scottish Government conducted a public consultation concerning the use of wild animals and travelling circuses in early 2014 in order to identify the ethical concerns and gauge public support or opposition to a Scottish ban. And I think it's probably also fair to say that it's caused discomfort to many people for, for many, many years. Those that are 
actively um, fighting for animal welfare and those that um, have a, a, a good respect for animals. And the majority of respondents to this particular consultation were in support of a ban, 98% in support of a ban on performance and 96% in support of a ban on exhibition of wild animals. Though I accept that that consultation is not the only reason or the main reason why this bill is necessarily before us today. And to remind the Chamber of the three ethical arguments for introducing the bill, these were firstly the impact on respect for animals, forcing animals to do unnatural tricks and acts for public entertainment, which caused them harm. Secondly, the impact of travelling environments on wild animals by keeping animals in temporary mobile accommodation for long periods and transporting them over long distances. And then lastly, weighing up the ethical costs and benefits. In other words, weighing up whether the ethical challenges, which are for probably fairly obvious to us, had um, any benefits and whether that, where that benefit was minimal, then it was deemed that um, it, legislation should be introduced to, for a complete ban. I think it's very, very important that we also assure circuses and other shows and events more generally that this bill should not be a threat to their um, work and to their entertainment services. Mm -hmm. I have been contacted by constituents who, who know who they are um, seeking that confirmation, the confirmation that this bill will not affect the good work that they do. And I think it's vital that we do assure those who are not displaying wild anim animals and who do not constitute a travelling circus that they can continue to provide excellent entertainment services. But in the meantime, I'll draw to a close. I'm delighted that this proposed bill will see Scotland leading the way in tackling the important ethical issue of the use of wild animals in travelling circuses. Thank you. We now move to the closing speeches and I call Claudia Beamish. Around five minutes, please, Ms Beamish. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Yesterday was, as I found out, uh, World Animal Welfare Day. And I think we should really all work together, as we've heard this afternoon, to sharpen this bill and to develop further protections in future, some of which I want to raise today. One kind reminds us that bans have already been introduced in at least 34 countries around the world, including 19 EU member states. Banning the use of wild animals in travelling circuses in Scotland is, of course, a forward-looking and progressive act that will lead the way for the rest of the United Kingdom, and they urge members to support the bill at stage one. While our Eclair Committee and Scottish Labour support the principles of the bill, as we have heard from other members today, its present form has necessitated a significant amount of committee work and consideration leading to our stage one report recommendations to the Scottish Government in order to make it fit for purpose. It is indeed disappointing that the Cabinet Secretary's response to our report was only available to members this morning, meaning there has been little time for consideration of it. However, be that as it may, I intend to focus on three aspects of the bill and that is the point about static circuses, a, a brief comment on definitions and also on enforcement. Both the Cabinet Secretary and Scottish Government official noted that the travelling aspect of the use of wild animals in travelling circuses was not a primary concern and it would therefore seem illogical not to re-examine the issue of wild animals in static circuses also. While acknowledging that a stage two amendment would be inappropriate as this has not been consulted on this bill, I hope and ask the Scottish Government to seriously consider static circuses as soon as possible. On definitions in relation to the wild animal definition, it is positive that the Cabinet Secretary stated in her response to our report, and I quote, I would be willing to explore a possible amendment giving a regulation making power to exclude or include specific animals as wild animals and might be, uh, that might be used in cases of real doubt in future. Regulations could be used where necessary following the coming into force of the bill to remove doubt in particular cases where it is uncertain as to the category of a particular kind of animal falls into. That could either be to include or exclude an animal as wild. I still think, as a number of other members in this chamber today, uh, that a, a list, at least in secondary regulation, which could be added to and amended, is the best way forward. And I am also of the opinion that the removal of reference to domesticated animals would bring clarity to the bill as we go forward. 
The committee considers that enforcement powers, as mentioned by Angus MacDonald within the bill, could go further and supports evidence received from local authorities for additional powers to intervene to prevent shows from taking place. David Kerr of Argyll and Butte Council said, as things stand, our only recourse currently would be to take the person to court. I do not know whether you have been involved in court cases recently. Let's hope none of us have, but there we go. Um, but to take a court case forward is not a quick process. And our committee recommendation is that the Scottish Government adopt the suggestions of local authorities, a power to serve notice, issue a fi pen fixed penalty notice, and power to obtain records. While I understand the argument made by the Cabinet Secretary's response, that the only, and I quote, the only question is whether or not the circus operator has caused or permitted a wild animal to be used in the travelling circus, and that, I quote again, all other activities are out with the ambit of the bill, I, I still ask the Cabinet Secretary to look very carefully at whether a stop notice would um, seem to be disproportionate, as she says, or whether indeed it would be possible to find some way forward on this issue so that there was real clarity on this. We do support the principle of the bill, and I do also thank the clerks, and, um, and I want to reflect again on how well the committee, if I may say so, appears to have worked together on this um, quite complex issue, perhaps a lot more complex than it should have been if it had, there'd been a bit more clarity um, earlier on um, from, uh, from the bill. But uh, we do support the principles, principles of the bill and we go forward to support that, but also many other um, welfare and ethical issues for animals in the future. Thank you. I call Finlay Carson. You can have a generous six minutes, Mr. Carson. Thank you, Deputy Not Presiding. Not too generous. Not too generous. <laughs> Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Today has been a very constructive debate with many valid and important points made on this bill. The debate was opened by the committee convener who addressed concerns over definitions, which poses the very first question over whether Graham Day is a tame wild politician or a wild domesticated politician, <laughs> and whether this domestication has taken place in this semi-circus over the many years he's been here. He mentioned the elephant in the room, and I did wonder whether he was referring to Donald Cameron's wonderful elephant design tie. And we were almost treated to some songs by Kate Forbes. Although there's been plenty of puns during the debate, it should in no way distract from the seriousness to which the committee and my colleagues in these benches take the subject of animal welfare. As my colleagues Donald Cameron, Peter Chapman and John Scott have eloquently set out during the course of today's debate, the Scottish Conservatives support the general principles of this bill reflecting the commitment that my colleagues have to the highest standards of animal welfare. We are supportive of a ban on the use of wild animals in travelling circuses on ethical and welfare grounds by delivering robust legislation. As we've heard in all the cross-party contributions, we all have a number of concerns concerning the current drafting of the bill and hope that the Cabinet Secretary will take on board the range of concerns we have heard both in committee and during today's debate. We in these benches support the findings and recommendations of the Clear Committee in relation to the current draft in the bill, and I would like to take this opportunity to commend that report. But why the rush? There are con concerns that with the apparent need to rush this bill through, and, will, and it will result in another piece of weak legislation from the Scottish Government, and that will fall down or fail to be ineffective in the courts. Now, Angus MacDonald mentioned that Scotland would be leading the way and that's all very well, but we need to show that legislation passed by this Parliament is good and robust legislation. And that may help with the concern he had with the Council's confidence in taking forward any future action. As the committee report set out, and as many of my colleagues have reiterated through the debate, travelling circuses which use wild animals in the context covered by the bill have not visited Scotland for many years and there is no indication that they are likely to any time soon. Therefore, is there any need to push through in the way that we are? Now, I can't speak for other colleagues in the chamber, but prior, but prior to the proposals of this legislation, I hadn't heard from anybody uh, regarding wild animals in travelling circuses. Unlike with puppy trafficking and other areas of animal welfare, I would suggest this is not necessarily a hot topic. 
But I understand the Cabinet Secretary disputes this in a rather late response to the committee received last night. Regardless, my point still stands. Why are we rushing this? Why not hold off and bring forward this legislation in a broader context, taking account of static circuses and other current areas of animal welfare, as suggested by my colleague Mark Ruskell? A cohesive, well-balanced and comprehensive piece of animal welfare legislation late in this Parliament would surely make more sense. Leo MacArthur rightly suggests that this current draft would be a paradise for lawyers. A number of members pointed out the current drafting of the bill doesn't define a circus and inadequately defines a travelling circus, the entire premise of this legislation. The concern is that the vague definitions risk criminalising those who put on a show or event where animals have to be transported to the event, and this must be clarified. Peter Chapman is quite right when he highlights the further concerns over the definition of wild animals. The vague nature of this definition leaves far too much room for the interpretation and I would echo colleagues from across the chamber in asking the Cabinet Secretary to seriously consider a list of animals that the bill seeks to protect. We agree with the, the committee view that the bill as currently drafted does not fully address the issues that it is proposed to cover and is at serious risk of capturing animal performances and shows that it may not have intended to. In conclusion, Unlike Emma Harper, Colin Smith and Claire Adamson, I've not spent any time exploring the use of the ethical argument or justifications behind this bill, because right across this chamber, we believe that public performance of wild animals is no longer acceptable and reflects, as Liam MacArthur has said, the values of us as, uh, in society. The majority of arguments made in this chamber this afternoon have been around the concerns that the bill is poorly drafted and could have potentials to fail in what it sets out to achieve. So, presiding officer, there's certainly plenty for the Scottish Government to take away from the stage one of this bill, and I hope they will consider all of our concerns inclusive, inclusively and constructively. We in these benches support the general principle and look forward to the Scottish Government bringing forward a much more robust, comprehensive and carefully drafted bill at stage two. I now call Rosanna Cunningham uh, to close this debate. Can you take us up to our half past four decision time, please, Ms Cunningham? <laughs> I'll do my best, uh, presiding officer, to do so. Um, can I begin by thanking all the members who've contributed during this debate, uh, not only in this session or indeed in the committee's considerations, but in the wider considerations of the parliament. Um, once again, I'm struck not only by the depth of insight afforded, but also by the passion and genuine commitment here to ensuring that Scotland does continue to be seen as a country that considers its animals with respect and compassion. I would also like to thank members and stakeholders, especially those from animal welfare organisations and just the vagaries of the iPad, which will slow me down slightly. Um, for being pragmatic about this bill and what it will achieve. And I, and I think I may come back to some issues around that because I think some of the um, interventions today uh, run the risk of losing sight of some of that pragmatism. It's not a complex piece of legislation. It's a short, focused bill to address a distinct and very particular ethical concern in the most timely way possible and making the most efficient and proportionate use of parliamentary time possible. This Parliament's commitment to tackling this issue head-on has drawn praise from all across the world and it would be truly a shame if we were to falter because of misunderstandings or technicalities that can be resolved. So I just want to remind members briefly of some of the key points I made earlier. The Bill will not interfere with the ownership, keeping or in fact transport of wild animals by a travelling circus so long as the animals are not performing or being displayed or exhibited. It will have no impact on the use of wild animals, whether sourced from a circus or otherwise, in film and TV production. What it will do is ban the use, performance and display of wild animals in travelling circuses, reflecting the strong and clear mandate the Scottish people gave us in our consultation uh, on this matter. I very much welcome the contributions to this debate and the consensus from across the chamber. 
that we should be at the forefront of this important issue. And I'd like now to just respond to some of the particular contributions uh, that have been made. Quite a few members, Graham Day and others, um, want to discuss issues around the various uh, definitions, or in their view, lack of definitions. And I just want to repeat for the purposes of the record that the definition of, for example, wild animals is a term consistent with the Welfare of Wild Animals in Travelling Circuses England Regulations 2012, the Animal Health and Welfare Act 2006, the Zoo Licensing Act 1981, and the Animals Act 1971. There's quite a lot of discussion here about listing wild animals, and I, I would caution members, I understand the desire to see that kind of list, but I truly would caution members as to where we can go with that kind of list in, uh, uh, on the face of the bill. I think it was Mark Ruskell that uh, talked about taxonomy um, and having a list of wild animals because taxonomy was straightforward. But I've advised that taxonomy is not straightforward, that it is constantly changing and people in fact make scientific careers out of it. There's even further complexity when we consider hybrids and subspecies, etc. So if we start to try and list wild animals that cannot be used in this fashion, that list will never be comprehensive and would need to be constantly reviewed and updated and would be constantly subject to, and one can imagine this, the imaginative use of animals that were not on that list. We currently, for example, don't have performing tapirs. Would a list that we produced of wild animals and traveling circuses include a tapir? Probably not, because we wouldn't think of it as being a standard animal to be used in that fashion. But if it's not on the list, then the likelihood is we will begin to see it. And that's the concern that I have when you list things. So what I have suggested... Yeah. Mark Ruskell. I mean, the Cabinet Secretary says there are people out there who make their careers in taxonomy making these kind of lists. Why, why can't the Scottish Government just ask them to produce the list? Rosanna Cunningham. Ultimately, I suppose it would be possible to have a list of every wild animal in the world, but there would always be some we are not currently aware of. Um, and, I, you know, I, 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 what I'm trying to do is caution people as to the unintended consequences of actually producing a list that then, by definition, excludes other wild animals because they're not on that list. That's the problem. And that is just something I want people to, to just consider. I have said that I would, can I just, I mean, I know that I do have some generous time, but I don't have totally unlimited time. David Stewart. <laughs> Officer, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for giving way. I understand the technical point the Cabinet Secretary is making, but presumably if you have a list of wild animals and have a provision in the Act that secondary legislation would allow the Cabinet Secretary to add any exceptions that come to mind, that's very easy to do using the statutory instrument process. Rosanna Cunningham. I've already indicated that the term wild animals is one that's widely used already in legislation. Um, and that what I would propose uh, as a concession is that we do have the capacity uh, to make specific reference if there are perhaps unexpected wild animals suddenly pop up uh, in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, their use. And I just think, I, again, I'm making the point about what happens with legislation once it's in black and white circus. I think I made it clear in my opening statement why I believe that, that, that the word circus be left to ordinary interpretation and that is already in use in the Welfare of Wild Animals Travelling Circuses England Regulations 2012. Should someone believe they can come up with a perfect definition previously unavailable to legislators, of course we can look at it. But I'm not sure that it is as easy as people think it is, and we already have the use of the word circus in legislation already in the UK. Now, a lot of contributions have understandably uh, talked about the the balance between welfare and ethics. And I, I get that, I, I understand that. Um, David Stewart, Peter Chapman and others have talked about that. But I would remind people that welfare evidence tends to be species specific. So the welfare requirements of one species are not the same 
as the welfare risk, the requirements of another species. Ethical arguments apply across the board. A lot of members veered from welfare concerns to ethical concerns and back again. And I just want to remind people of the timeline here. At the time we consulted on this, in 2014, we were in a situation where the 2007 Radford report had ruled out a welfare-based approach. So we consulted in 2014 on an ethical-based uh, uh, approach instead. Two years after that, there then came uh, a Dorning report, uh, and I think that's the Welsh one that uh, people referred to, which did provide more up-to-date evidence of welfare concerns for particular species in travelling circuses and other mobile animal exhibits. But as I indicated, that doesn't necessarily support a complete prohibition of these uses for all conceivable types of wild animals on welfare grounds alone. If wide-ranging, accurate and robust welfare evidence had been available when we started working on this issue, and you know, I have to just push a little back on this uh, you know, notion that this has come out of the blue somehow and we're rushing it through, we consulted on this in 2014. Had we had the kind of detailed welfare information available at that time, then perhaps we would have taken things forward on the basis of secondary legislation under the Animal Health and Welfare Scotland Act. Um, and that would have been a slightly different route to have followed if the welfare approach hadn't become too complicated because of the different species involved. But I don't detect any desire on the part of stakeholders to delay a ban any further. And I don't believe there is any need as the ethical arguments put forward in support of this ban uh, are valid. Um, in conclusion, presiding officer, um, to be on the safe side with you, um, we have seen successive Westminster governments commit to just such a ban as this and then be unable to see it through for whatever reason, perhaps addressing some of the concerns that have been uh, raised here. I'm proud of the work that this parliament has done to progress this issue this far. I'm conscious that I haven't covered all of the points raised uh, by members. Um, some have talked about the late arrival of our response. Can I just point out to members that we didn't receive the final report until the 22nd of September. So we have had to turn that round in, in quite a fast time frame. The practical impact of this bill, we believe, will in all truth be minimal. Uh, there are no travelling circuses as in, uh, uh, without wild animals based in Scotland. None have visited in some time, nor are they likely to in the future. But by progressing this bill, I do believe that we are laying down an important and symbolic marker with regards to how we value and treat all our animals. And I commend it to the Chamber. Thank you very much, Minister and Members. That concludes our debate. We move... Oh, point of order, Lee MacArthur. John Scott, I should have uh, declared that I am an uh, honorary member of the BBA during the course of that debate, an oversight on my part, uh, for which I apologise, not least as I then went on to quote the BBA in my remarks. So, thank you very much. Can I thank Mr MacArthur for that helpful update and clarification. So we go straight to decision time and there is one question to be put as a result of today's business. The question is that motion 8062 in the name of Prisanna Cunningham on stage one of the Wild Animals in Travelling Circuses Scotland Bill be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. That concludes decision time. I wish members a productive recess and I close this meeting.